So first off, thanks for letting me present here. I think this is uh, a great class that these guys put together. I've never quite seen anything like it, and unfortunately I didn't get to do it when I was doing my PhD. But I'm glad to still be able to contribute and uh, think about these things. I'm working closely with the Roofs Group on um, the Sustainability and Data Sciences Lab. So we've talked about a lot of cool ideas um, about how to make this resilient, the you know, mass port resilient in, in terms of the facility or component level, all the different things that um, you could do for uh, you know, critical substations, all the things that are being done. Um, cool ideas like the duck boat thing, which I thought was really interesting. But what's what I've seen has been, or what we've all seen has been lacking in, in um, both the scientific literature and, and then especially in practice is how do you look at a total system, whether that system is just mass port alone or an extension of mass port, so when we talked about, you know, its dependency on, on the on getting traffic coming in from the aquarium stuff on the blue line and the electricity sec uh, sector and all these things, how do you go up from the top level and look at this quantitatively? So a, a system level look at these things. So, you know, we can think of, what we, what, we, what we can actually do is, besides just think of these things as these facility level ideas, how do we actually, and to your point earlier, we want to think about this as a, how can we find a process that we could repeatedly um, do and measure the, the performance of that process and something like the return of investment. And I think I'm excited about this idea because I think it really gives us a framework for thinking about that. So this is research that's being done um, and, and led especially by Udi Latia, um, Devashis Kumar, and, and Roop, a lot of this. Um, so we can think of these, so this is sort of the analogy here. There's a, a component, what a component is to a system. So a component could be the substation that we care about it, you know, within Massport, and the system is Massport itself, is equivalent to a facility and network and what I'm going to talk about here. So we can think of networks as global networks, like a global airline network, right? Um, the global shipping network, we can think of them at multiple scales, we can think of them at national scales. The U.S. Airlines network, we can even think of national or global scale networks where we're looking at two networks and how they behave together, so how the power and communication networks interrelate to each other regional networks, and then all the way down, you can actually uh, think of you know Boston Logan itself, in some sense, as a network. Beautiful thing about network science, and what I'm about to explain here, is that it scales very well at these different levels, and it gives us a systematic way of thinking about these things from the top down, as well as, and it complements, I think, what a lot of, uh, you know, all these things that have been done from sort of the bottom-up perspective is how do we how do we deal with this particular substation and this particular interaction, et cetera. So we haven't done this specifically for Massport yet, right? So I hope to uh, use this case study and try to uh, preserve some analogies to how this would look if we did this for Massport. Um, with this uh, work that's pending right now was done on the Indian Railway Network. And there was some, uh, some small discussion about this earlier. So the, the railway network is, uh, you know, it's a vital lifeline network of, of India. Um, and in terms of, you know, it transports millions of passengers a day. In terms of thinking about this and how this how this maps to a system, a facility or like a component of the system is equal to a station. Right, so it's a train station. Um, and those train stations are connected through different pieces of rail. A sector is a network or a system, right? So a sector could be the electricity sector in this case, this is the transportation sector. And then some, some vernacular like cascades. So in the, in the event of 2012, there was a, a you know, massive failure of the power grid. And it was interesting, if you trace the roots of that, that failure, it was actually a cascade through multiple systems, which ultimately related back to uh, weak monsoon rainfall, over pumping of groundwater, and uh, lack of water to, to support the power grid, which then caused the railway network to fail which I'll talk about a little bit more. And then we've taken this framework, and it's a quantitative way of looking at these things, and we can look at, the, the beautiful thing about this is we can look at any type of threat, and how that threat would, uh, or hazard, would impact the system, like mass port, right? So it could be a natural um, uh, or climate-related threat. So it could be a hurricane. It could be a hurricane that we can see right now. It could be like the blizzard that we've had in the last, you know, sequence of blizzards that we've had in the last few weeks have impacted all of us. Uh, or it could be cyber physical type threats, right? Et cetera. So, how do 
how we actually do this, right? So we, we took this, this Indian Railway Network, and we quantitatively, and this is a visual representation, but we quantitatively represent it at its full state of functionality. So each of these dots here is, is actually, or each of these um, nodes is actually a train station. Um, the size of it reflects the volume of passengers going through. The colors represent some sense of sub-network structure. So what this really gives us, so it gives us a sense of, you know, sort of how disparate these sub-networks are. There's minimal interaction between them, but there's, the, the interactions between these sort of colored sub-networks are really important. But what it gives us is a benchmark or a baseline to quantify, and we can translate these colors and this structure into numbers, right? It gives us a benchmark to quantify this system or this network at full, like, functionality or performance. So that any breakdown in that performance, we can actually quantify and compare to that benchmark. So, for example, this is this uh, we we simulated. What we did was we simulated you know the same region that was first where that the blackout was first impacted, or where it, where it was incurred, where 700 million million people were um, affected in total over a course of a few days, and. We mentioned that, by the way, there's, we can actually blend these two networks together if we want to, meaning these two different systems of the electric grid and the, um, and the, the railway network itself, and then build this same picture, but post, at a or post blackout or during blackout at a state of reduced functionality. Now we can quantitatively compare that reduced functionality to the full functionality. So what does this actually give us in terms of the framework for thinking about quantitative resilience, right? We've talked about all these different ideas to do this, these component level things, but to your point earlier, we can't do, make everything resilient, right? We can't do everything 100%. In a perfect world, we wouldn't. We wouldn't have to think about this sort of thing. But what people have been thinking about, let's, let's make the, look at this conceptual curve yet yeah, uh, first, is... So when a hazard has, so we've got a, a line that's saying we're at essential functionality. And that's on the, the vertical <coughs> axis here. Something happens, a hazard happens. Functionality is reduced and you have to respond to that. So what do you do when the, you know, when the blizzard hits? At some point you have to recover that system and get it back to full functionality, or critical functionality, minimum. And then ideally, you learn from that and you proactively design the system to be better. Right? But this has only been conceptual so far. So this is, a, I think this is a great idea. You can actually, based on these idea, uh, based on this you know, network science framework, uh, starting <coughs> on the last slide, you. you can build a quantitative version of that same resilience curve, or the same resilience time series. <coughs> so what we can do is, and, and again, in, in uh, view of the limited budget, limited resources that we have to do this. What do we tackle first, right? So in terms of responding when a, when a disaster happens, we can use this methodology to figure out the least impact, proactive hazard, least financially, you know, economically, or whatever impact, proactive hazard response. So the graceful taking offline of certain assets, right? Um, or whatever the case may be to cause the least amount of damage to your overall system when it's happening as well as when you get to the point where you, it's time to bring that system back to its regular functionality, what we found, and this is looking at an overall network or even just a, or an overall system or even subsystem. So if you think of the overall system as Massport, you could also think of a subsystem that if you really just want to restore you know, um, uh, critical functionality that enables military operations, this same strategy works on that sub-network. It scales to that level too. So, even this idea even beats restore, uh, sort of intuitive restoration strategies. So, if I was to say, okay, the whole you know the whole Massport system is down. In this case, it's the Indian Railway Network, but the whole system is down, right? I could tr I could try to restore maybe um, um, a part that where we know that you know maybe if this was the MBTA, let's say that where there you know a stop where there's high volume of passengers going in first, or you know. Um, if I was thinking of a, a nationwide airline network um, or a coastal airline network, which, which you know, 
airport that I restore first just by the number of connections, we found that, and this seems to hold over different types of attacks, there are different types of threats, I guess I would say, that you can actually use these network science-based metrics and restore these things faster. So that just gives you a sense of where you prioritize the fixes. And this sub-graphic right here is to say, well, we, we did the same thing, but within a uh, just one uh, region of India and got the same sort of answer, which was that, yes, these network metrics still eventually outperform um, uh, more sort of into common intuition metric, uh, common intuition measures in terms of where you um, where do you put your resources on? So I think that's powerful because what it's saying is that you can take all of these. We have, a, you know, when we want to uh, evaluate what, you know, because so we had these one-year and five-year budgets where we're, we're thinking of spending a million or five million dollars, uh, um, or whatever the case may be. How do I decide what strategy? Where should I focus all these efforts? And we've got fuels, we've got electricity, we've got all these lifeline networks that are, are feeding things, but the reality is we don't have billions of dollars to do this, so how do we pick those things out? On top of that, we also know that climate change is a threat multiplier, right? A lot of the work we've been doing is actually looking at, um, it's a separate, but I want it to come together, and that's why I'm here is to think through these things. Um, how we do probabilistic modeling of climate change to sort of Get a manageable, um, manageable, probabilistic distribution of what we could see in the future in a region or a locality like Boston. So, for example, um, if you're looking, if you're just thinking, and this could be done for hurricanes um, or whatever type of uh, natural hazard. We know that what used to be a one in forty year event is now a one in thirty year event, and this is sort of averaged over the globe and it varies region. And models project that you know by the end of the century, what is now a 30-year event could happen once every five years. And in between, of course, there's some gradient to how that becomes the case. But again, and this is used, you know, these are for metrics that are useful for actual like design uh, load factors or curves. Um, but of course, the uncertainty gets larger when you go down to a specific location. You know, how what is it? What exactly am I going to be facing? Um, and what we're working on is saying is a framework for actually. Uh, what we're calling physics guided data mining or physics guided data science um, for figure out for, for figuring out how to do probabilistic modeling we're, we're, we're uh, a long ways there already and we have more work to do of course but probabilistic modeling of, of regional um, uncertainties in extremes and what we want to do is then uh, specifically focus on those for the components that we really care about in that overall system where we need to bring the system down gracefully and bring it up quickly and in proactive design for uh, looking into the next 30 to 50 years. So that's all I've got. All right. Thank you. Great. Great.